This is an interview which I did with George Wiseman around uh, 2007. Uh, George uh, had been a member of the Federated Malay States Voluntary Forces, commonly called the Vultures, uh, who were a voluntary, as it says, a voluntary unit uh, in the Malaya. Now, when the Japanese invaded uh, southern Thailand and northern Malaya on the 8th of December 1941, George was actually in India on his honeymoon. Being a responsible person, he made arrangements with some difficulty to return to Singapore to uh, join his unit and participate in whatever was necessary uh, for the defence of Malaya and Singapore. He was on a vessel called the Taisang, and I'll just check the spelling of that, the T-A-I-S-A-N-G, uh, when he was moving from Calcutta to Singapore when that vessel was in fact uh, torpedoed and sunk. So uh, George, before the fall of Singapore, uh, had spent time in the water. He was recovered, uh, went to uh, uh, Singapore and uh, was in, the, in that particular area when he contributed as a member of his unit uh, to the defence of that area. 15th of February of 1942, along with everyone else, he became a prisoner of war. Then, in October 1942, he went to, he was sent to Thailand, and he was in the southern area of the, uh, what was known as the Burma-Thailand Railway, and uh, the camps he was in started originally at Ban Pong when they got off the train, and then he was in camps such as uh, Chong Kai, uh, Tam Tamakan, and uh, up as far as Kinsayok. But uh, enough of what I am uh, giving you as background. Uh, we will now hear uh, George's story in his own words. But I regret to start by informing you that the first about uh, 90 seconds of the tape are missing. So if you'll bear with that. to destroy the booze in Surimban. Oh yes, yes. And well, they were also told that they could take all that. They could take. Yes. <laughs> well, they all loaded their lorries up with whiskey and gin and so mm -hmm. on. And so we always had booze right through the end of the war. Yes. you know these army lorries, four yes. wheel things, yes. had very large tool chests yes. on either side. Yes. Well, they empty one tool chest and fill that with booze. Yes. And so whenever we stopped, we mm. have <laughs> some some refreshments. Yeah, <laughs> which rather saved my life occasionally. I, was, I got a very bad kind of shell shock mm. and I was just drinking too much. Yes. And I, I got some medicine or other which made me, I didn't care damn where it was. I don't know where yes. it was. Uh, one of our passengers, who was a traveller I think for medical stuff, and he uh, died, uh, was drowned in the ship, and the ship went down. And I went, he had been talking to me about what he'd been doing, where he was going. Mm. He was only a traveller that I'd come from a lot of known by him, over 70. And um, he uh, said, oh, he'd been uh, reporting to the British dispensary. And so and I went round to the British dispensary and told him all about mm. this. He was very grateful. He was a great old friend of his too. And uh, I said, well, sir, I'm an awful nervous state. Can you give me anything? Mm. And he made a bottle of tonic or what the hell it was, I don't know, but it didn't care damn what was after that. <laughs> Sounds like it was a perfect solution to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting rather scared stiff. Yes. And there was a continuous air <laughs> And as I say, I didn't. And so after that, we had a very cheerful walk. Yes. Couldn't care less. Um, I've got, you ask me about photos. Yes. I don't know any of those, uh, that's me. Yeah. yeah, it's too small for us to get a 
Oh, okay, good. That was taken in Rangoon. We we've been out to joke about it. Yes. Fortnight by then, I mean. Yeah. Oh, so actually, you you sort of weathered it reasonably well. It, although you can put on weight very quickly yes. when you're well fed. Mm. Yeah. Well, you see, immediately after the surrender, yes, they dropped food into our camp. Yes, and the local tides also came in because so, our guards had all disappeared. Yes. Well, there's a, uh, there was a British officer by the name of Bill Drower, who was an interpreter. Drower. Drower. But he was on the Burma end. Mm -hmm. uh, but Noguchi, did you ever hear of Noguchi? He was the commander, Japanese commander at, uh, uh, at, at Ken, Ken, Kanchanabri. Kanchanabri. Oh. And uh, he had put uh, Drower in a pit for 11 weeks with... Nice blood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is a drawing done by a British artist of him two days after capitulation. That's him there. Mm. Uh, 17th of August, 1945. And they said that just in two days, because he'd got good food, he had improved greatly. Yes, it's surprising how he did. Yes. Mind you, I was lucky one thing. I, I never had um, bad dysentery. Yes. That's that. Mm, yes. Um, where was the other photo? I want, uh, anyway, one of these would be of use to you if I get it blown up. Yes, uh, particularly that one, I think. Yeah. Uh, and was that sort of in the vicinity of where we, that restaurant that we... Yes, it's roughly where that restaurant was. Yes, yeah. We were crossing the river there. Yeah. Because to we were, besides saving him, there were a lot of tools there. Yes. And we were told to dive for them. Yes. So we found them immediately. Came up. We kept it up for two hours looking at these dark things. And then one of the I think we had enough of this diving. Yes. So we found them. Yes. So we, oh, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, where were you born? In uh, London, actually. Yes. In Silverton, sorry. Mm -hmm. and, what was the, and what were the circumstances of you being in Singapore? Uh, my father married my mother and hadn't got a job, and they were offering jobs in the plantations. Mm -hmm. and just before I was born, he went out and um, planted near uh, Babgaja. Yes. And in 1914, my mother brought me out to join him. So yes. I first started over mm -hmm. there. And then, of course, the war, we were there. Yeah. Now, what, what year were you born? 1910. 1910, so that makes you 93 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. but, um, that's how it became from there, of course. Um, when I had finished school, there was not much chance of jobs in England. And my old man was, well, he was a very senior position in Malacca. Yes. And he had me out and then uh, used his influence to get me into a firm when things were really bad mm -hmm. in 29 and 30, you know. During the... Yeah. Was the depression and, and, uh, difficult for conditions, and economic conditions in Singapore, like it was in Australia? I think it was fairly bad, mm. but um, I mean, I, I only got out there because the, um, a fortnight before I'd spoken to a friend, my father's worked in the firm, he said, I'll find out for you when you'd like to go east, and he said, call me over, he said, no chance to talk at the moment. Mm. And about <laughs> ten days later, the uh, porter in our office, you know, in one of these said, you're required to see Mr. Bertie once, Mr. Wiseman. I said, well, what have I done? Not feeling too good on a Monday morning. Okay. And he said, how soon can you, Mr. Dark Wiseman, that looks a bit better. 
And he said, how soon can you go out east? I said, go to Murray if you like, sir. Yes. It's still not of much hurry as that. But, but uh, if you're happy to go, send you in the beginning of December. And that was in 31. Yes. And then I went out and worked for them from then until I retired. Mm. So, the only reason everybody had gone up one, because one of the senior men uh, had to be invalided home and they were one man short. Yes. That's the only reason I got out then. Yes. But, uh, now, when did you meet your wife? Oh, well, that was rather amusing too. It was in Malacca. I, um, I'd had a girlfriend from like around two thousand, broken it off. Mm. Rather drinking and so on, and we went to Malacca Club. Well, yes. It was a dance, it was now a museum. Yes. And, uh, and the old man said, Are you drunk enough, go and join that Paul Jones. And I stopped up at this girl and got on very nice and I said, come and meet my father. I said, oh, I met him last night. And got him along and he was annoyed and he said, I wanted to introduce it to you. Yes. <laughs> and that's how it started. Yes. Mm. And about what, what year was that? Um, that was... Well, maybe 37, I think it was. Oh, I don't know if it was, that was 37, when were you married? Mm. When when were you married? Well, three months later, because her sister was very aching to get her out of the country, and didn't approve of me, I don't know. Ah. And um, I said, I had to get married very quickly, and I all met fixed in the world. Yes. Um, I think you told me. 39. Right. We were married, and that's a dark pole, has got to bring me a bit of an now the, so that if you're married in, in 39, I thought that you had previously told me when the Japs invaded in about December 1942. Uh, December 41. 40, thank you, 41. Uh, you were in India, right? India, yes. yes. The firm suddenly told me that I have due for leave and I'm go and if you come down to Australia. So they don't want to go to Australia. No no friends there or anything. My wife's got a sister in the army, Royal Pindy. Yes. I said, oh, that's all right. So we went there. Yes. And we were up in Sri Lanka when the, the balloon went up. I was getting myself some gilded boots, I mean, special ones, mm -hmm. for going on the snow. Mm -hmm. And the, bar what we call a barrack man in Malayali, Chappie was telling these things, you know, they turn up with a hammer, with a, a pack full of things. Yes. And he said, uh, where did you come from? And I said, oh, Singapore. He said, oh, it was bombed last night. Mm. And, uh, and uh, then we got to try the radio, and perfectly correct. Mm. And so I said, I'd better go back to... Um, Oh, Pindy, well, it's just about when we got there, um, they had already left for Amanagra or somewhere south. Mm -hmm. and so I went to, um, my wife and I went down to Calcutta with her, day, and I worked for the shipping line for a bit, waiting to get instructions. And there were once they had confidential cables there on ships' movements. They, they included a message, why isn't the bust? It requires instructions. Yes. And the instructions came back. Why isn't the service is no longer required? Uh, leave him make decision. I thought, well, I'd better go back as the volunteers have all been embodied. And so I went back. And day but the evening, or well, the night before, in Singapore, we were. We were edged into the minefield and then the front of the boat was uh, took to the water then. And we were picked up a little, well, that was four in the morning, we picked up at eight o'clock. Yes. But our minefield had come to clear the path to Now, the was that an allied minefield? Yes. Yes. And around what date is this that we're talking about? Uh, about 29th, 30th of January. January. So nearly a, f a little bit over a fortnight before mm. capitulation. Mm. 
Now you did mention you were going back to the volunteers. How long had you been a member of the uh, volunteers? Well, since 1930, beginning of 32. Yes. And were they uh, an, an efficient? Uh, Not particularly. Shall we call them militia units? <laughs> That, of course, uh, that a lot of their officers were ex firstborn and so on. Yes. But, uh, I mean, except for arms, we didn't do very much. Dan, you, you've, you've read Dennis Peake's book, I'm sure, but he wasn't very impressed with the officers in, at any level, actually, at any time, <laughs> was he? No. Mm. All right, so you were picked up and uh, taken ashore. Mm. Uh, so, did much happen to you during from over that fortnight during the fighting for the uh, defence of Singapore? Well, as I think I mentioned I was told to report to Changi where the rest of the volunteers were. And I yes. Ran into an old friend, asked me where I was. Funny, he's just retired as bank manager. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll, if, we'll, if we could just go back, uh, you were telling me about the time that you... Well, when I joined the... Um, when I didn't join the volunteers, I yes. rejoined them. Yes. Well, this was another uh, unit, the 40 Rift, 45th Reserve MT, something it was called. And um, they got these American Mum and Harrington four-wheel drive lorries. Yes. And they hadn't got enough drivers. And they said, can you drive one? And I said, well, the only big thing I've done is the Epo fire engine. Mm -hmm. You know, the yes. old one with the yes. girl. Said, they said, oh, you'll do all right. Hey. And the chap in charge of Major Shamley was a, a rubber planter I knew. And of course, they accepted me with open arms. And I said, what about told to report to Colonel Riches. He said, oh, that matter, I'll fix that. Mm -hmm. And I ran into Colonel Riches later on in the hotel there. And <laughs> told him what would happen. <laughs> he was another rubber plant. Yes. And he would be laughing, he said, well, good luck to you. And so I was given this diary. And uh, I <coughs> asked if somebody would show me how to drive it because it was four wheel and I never heard of a four wheel drive by then mm. and it had two gear levers and uh, one for the four wheel drive and the other just ordinary and they said well we want you to, to go out tonight and this, this, this great book of Paul's known as uh, Jimmy Green and he was I was a tin miner mm -hmm. who came out and introduced himself. He said, don't you worry, Bestie and I look after you. And they were in the same unit. Yes. And when we went on a convoy, one or other was behind me and the other in front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we drove down and up somewhere downtown, Penis Road I think it was, to collect Indian troops to take them up towards the causeway. Yes. And um, which we did. Mm. Stopping quite often to see how the toolbox was. Ah. Um, that was my first <laughs> bit of so-called action. Now that uh, those trucks when did they have the what they call a crash box? You they were, they didn't have synchronized gears like yeah. you have in a truck now. Yeah. It would require quite a bit of skill to yes. to change gears without mm -hmm. crunching them. I managed to do that. Yes. Yes. I, well, I managed to yes. had a car for yes. years without synchronisation. Now, if you were going up close to the causeway, therefore, it must have been very. It must have been early in February. Oh, yes, we were mm. st still on the mainland. Yes, yes. And some of our units had been uh, driving up Johor, taking stuff up. Yes. And I, I never on that. Yes. Do you? Is, the, is it clear in your mind the uh, 8 o'clock at night or half past 8 at night on the 15th of February when uh, capitulation occurred? You know, the, the, as I understand, the, the 
uh, artillery stopped firing and there was an eerie silence. Uh, do you recall anything like that? Um, yes, because we have been um, gradually getting in and into the centre. We mm. were in the customs house uh, and um, the lorries parked outside. And, um, no, before, I think, no, just before we went in, uh, um, the, the CEO uh, came on and said, what, two volunteers to take the Lewis guns out and destroy them. I said, well, I'll come out of my head. And so we went to the side of the Singapore River and smashed these as much as possible. And there were three, I think, uh, maybe more, these old-fashioned Lewis guns which, uh, I don't know, we never used them anyway, but mm -hmm. we took them out and found them mm -hmm. and um, dropped them in the sea. They served no good to anybody after that. Right. And uh, I think as we were doing that, somebody, uh, an OR went by and he said, oh, I understand there's a party going up there. Bukitima Road. And we didn't hear anything more after that. And as you say, there was a silence and that was the end of it. And when did your officers come and tell you that the, the surrender had taken place? No, they didn't have a clue either. No. Nobody told, told our unit. Mm. Mm. Place. Mm. And from the time of the surrendering in uh, February to say October when you went to Thailand, what tasks did the Japanese force you to do on the island in the in the meantime? Well, uh, in Singapore, our first job was um, going from Changi. Uh, no, where were we? No, they were I was in Changi up to another date will show you in, in the diary. And then we were moved to have a lot road camp. Yes. Because next door was the Aussie camp. That's, they were in uh, Ro Roberts Barracks, were they? No, uh, no, there was another part that I was getting muddled. Um, but the Aussies were um, further in Solaran, I suppose it was. Well, they were spread yeah. around a bit. Mm. Mm. We hardly saw them at all. We were separated. Yes. So what did they? What work did they make you do? Uh, for the first three weeks or so, I don't think we did very much. I think we started uh, the vegetable gardens going. Very wise. Mm. Yes. And, um, did you work on the wharves or, or anything like that? Or not in those days. No. What about the out of the? Is it the Ritchie River Reservoir where they? No. They, they built a monument? Um, all I did really was when we were moved to Singapore to, to have up Road. Yes. And from there, our first job was going back to Changi in the lorries and loading them with sand. Yes. For um, uh, go down to warehouses. Yes. They were built to, off uh, have up Road. So you actually continue to be employed by them as a truck driver, were you? No, I was uh, not even a truck driver, no. No. And, and most of the trucks in those days, a lot of them were from the RSC, I think, mm -hmm. or NIPS. Yes. But, and I think the first time we went to Changi it was a European driving, I suppose it must have been the RSC. Mm -hmm. RSC, I think. Now, you we, we know that you went to Thailand in in October forty mm. two. How how did you find out that you were going to move away from Singapore and were you told anything about where you were going and what sort of conditions you'd be facing? Some people were told we were going to a much better camp north, uh, where the food and so on was better. Did you have any idea of uh, what sort of transport they had in, uh, in mind for you? No, we knew we got to go up and these tin trucks. Yes. Thirty men in a truck. 
No. And how many days did it take to get up to Thailand? About five days, I think it was. Five days. And uh, we got to Ban Pong. Yes. And then we marched to um, Ban Pong to the next base in the country. Uh, Can Canchanabri? Yes. Or it used to be called Canbury in Canberra, those days. Be called Canbury. Yes. And was that one of your camps? Were you stayed there for a while? We were only uh, there um, about two days, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they were, uh, we had a medical inspection, and Pavlov said my heart was behaving rather oddly, and that I shouldn't march. And with about half a dozen others in another similar condition. Uh, when they all the others marched up to uh, Tassa, I suppose it was, um, we were given a lift in a what we called a pom pom. It's a, a small with a one-stroke engine, yes. which uh, the uh, was run on coconut oil, and every mile or so, they it, it had to take the head off. <laughs> And clean it up. Yes. It made it cause a lot of amusement. Yes. So we only had one jack guard on this boat and about half a dozen of us, I think. So what you're saying is the rest of your group marched to Tarsal mm -hmm. and you had the luxury of going up on the uh, Quinoy River mm -hmm. uh, by the Pom Pom. Mm -hmm. So that was to Tarsal. Mm -hmm. So what happened at Tarsal? Uh, we transferred back to Wampo. Yes. We didn't even step. Uh, we went ashore, I think, there, but then we, we drank it back to Wampo. So you you marched back to Wampo, or did you? I think we got a lift again. Did you? Yes. I think we've been lucky. Yes. Now, the engineering, could you tell us something about the engineering of the Wampo viaduct, or how, how big a project it was? Um, well, when we got there, there was nothing. Mm. And our first few weeks, we were just clearing redshifts through the jungle uh, from Wampo North. Yes. And then a small group were put to Wampo South, roughly where that restaurant is. Yes. And we, we were there quite a while. Um, clearing the jungle and um, then getting the track. It was being dynamited a lot because a pal of mine was hit in the face by a stone when he was sitting in the hut. Went past my nose mm -hmm. and hit him in the face. And that was across the river, was it, when mm -hmm. you were sitting in the hut? Yeah. Yes. They used to do the the um, dynamiting after, after we'd gone back. Yes. In those days. And that was to recreate the ledge to put the actual yes. viaduct on. Mm. Okay, so that, were you amongst the group of POWs that had to s swim the river to go to work, or did you go across by barge? We went across by barge, as far as I can remember. And the, does that mean you couldn't swim? Or was there a reason why you didn't? I don't seem to remember. I remember doing a lot of swimming in that river. Yes. Well, that would have been beneficial, mm. refreshing. So the, were you actually there when the actual viaduct, the construction was finished? No. no. We cleared that and then we were shipped up north, somebody else came and did all that. So I never saw the viaduct. No. So how far up did you go? Um, well, we went to the main camp. And after that... Was it Kinsayok or...? Not too certain. Might be worth looking it up. Yes. Do you remember on the trip up there last year we went to Kinsayok where there's mm. a little waterfall? Mm. Well, I never even mm. didn't know there was a waterfall. Mm. I know when we got to one it hadn't been uh, it, it hadn't been built properly. Yes. Because we spent a lot of time putting the antipod. Yes. Um, 
We were all just did that very badly. We pointed out that we got to sleep and we better made a better job of it. <laughs> um, a small diesel launch, a really old affair that which burnt mainly coconut oil and was started with a blow lamp. Yes. We chugged along with two or three knots. That's when we joined the, uh, the rest of the whole crowd of Tonkins. That was the last part of the day. Because we were all right with food and so on there, but she just sat round the fire and shivered. A friend of Ty took quite a few in his shack and gave them food and shelter. Mm. I said Ty's without exception treated us as friends. that's a little bit different from their experience in the following year when they'd, uh, the Japs had asserted their authority over the tires. Mm. We heard him yelling during the night and understood he was shot in the morning. Mm. Nice and cheerful. Yes. That was the tire who the knife. Yes, I, I followed what you were saying. Mm. You, you went north from Wampo. Mm -hmm. You went back north from Wampo, didn't you? Because you were at Kinsay Ock at some stage. Yes, I don't know where we... Cause you, I think you told me on one occasion that you you, you were... I think you most probably went straight to Kinsay Ock. Yeah, operating a store up at Kinsay Ock for them? Were you a storeman for, for them? For a bit. Yes. But, um, that was a very good job. Not many of them, so make the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you're up at Kinsayok, I, I remember your uh, acquaintance is what the term I'd use, Ian Peake. He was at Kinsayok, but he was actually running a sawmill a little bit further further mm -hmm. up. Uh, and he had it relatively easy there. Uh, they just had a quota to, to meet each day, and that was what they, they did. Do you... When you were at Kinsale, did did you have anything to do with any... It was a big camp of 5,000 people, wasn't it? Mm. Did you have anything to do with any of the Aussies there? Uh, not really. We didn't seem to mix much. Mm. Except I always remember, who was it? Leeds, the, the opera singer or singer? No, I don't know. Well, there was a well-known singer amongst the Aussies who was... Was there? We used to hear him singing. He was absolutely wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what, did you have any, any experience with any chaplains? Um, I'm trying to remember the RC one. The, the, there was a Presbyterian one with the volunteers, not with the volunteers, the British now. Uh -huh. It was fairly useless. Mm. But there was an RC. Not a, if it was a RC, it would have been a, a guy named a Chaplain Padre Paddy Walsh? Might have been. Mm. He was very good. He didn't, you see, some of them, uh, there was one Padre, I think, who wouldn't take services for non RCs. Mm. But um, this Padre was wonderful. Oh, Walsh didn't distinguish between no. religions. No. Because I know Jimmy Green was smoking a cigarette made from pages of his Bible. And <laughs> Walsh came along and said, what are you smoking there? And, oh, holy smoke, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, yes. <laughs> that, that always amused me, that one. Did you, uh, were you at Kinsale when, when the line was laid and 
Were any of the trains getting up there no. at that stage? No, I tried to remember when we saw the first train. My memory's a bit dim about that. Actually, I never didn't see the trains until it had been running through some time. Mm. It kept another job. Yeah. And how was your general health? Uh, not too bad. Well, the one bit of luck, I don't know what it, why I did it, but um, when we went to India, I was going for the medicine chest and I saw a little bottle pop mang, a potassium mm -hmm. magnet, and I shoved it in my bag there, and when the ship sunk, it was in my kit bag which I put on top of my life belt. Mm -hmm. and when we couldn't get fresh water, I always put a few specks in water. Yes. I remember telling one of the doctors about it, he said, the best thing you could possibly do. Is that right? You know, mm. Drinking it pink. Mm. It? Yes. And, uh, so I, that lasted a very long while. Mm. And I only used it two or three specks at a time. Yes. But I had a bit of stomach trouble, but never think anything serious. Mm. How about, how about malaria? I uh, didn't get malaria until later on. Oh. We were out at Kinsau and were um, moved down to what we call the river camp, a little way down, which is a, a delightful spot on the edge of the river. And the, there were 200 of us, I think, and only about two guards. And um, we were there to help the surveyors. Well, the surveyors never needed more than half a dozen men. The rest were left in camp to do what they liked. We used to bathe in the river, mm -hmm. help the champagne, the champagne through the uh, rapids there, some rapids up the place. Mm -hmm. And generally had a very good time there. But then when we'd been there about a week, we started going down with malaria. and. It got extremely bad, and that's when I first got my malaria, and that quite well on a bit. Mm. There again, I said, couldn't find it, couldn't fault the Nips' behaviour. I mean, these two blokes who were in charge of us kind of said, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. Yes. Did you have any contact with the Koreans? Uh, later on. Mm. And uh, do you have... How did they compare with the Japanese guards? They varied so much. Mm. There was a Korean in charge of the store when I went to the store at Kinsai, who was very good. And I know he came to us one day and said, um, um, there's a, a general inspection tomorrow. Um, we'll be cleaning the rifles for them, which we did, but the British sergeant in the party was an armourer sergeant, and he said, oh, that's good. And anyway, I took the first um, rifle to bits, to clean it and so on, and I said to the sergeant, when I pressed the trigger, nothing seems to come out, you see, and he looked at it and said, some clever bastard. <laughs> Um, filed them all down, and the other rifles, they were all the same. Oh. They'd never been fired at them. Well, three or three. Well, so they were the weapons that they'd captured from the Allies? Yes. Oh. But um, who did the dirty work on them, I don't know. Oh. But oh. I remember going and reporting to the Colonel there oh. that the, the guards who got these rifles thought it might be useful information. So. When you say the colonel, who was that? Um, might have been Lily. Lily? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't swear to it. Yes. Yeah. Now, you, when I ask you about the doctors, we, we've discussed Pavillard, but what uh, what can you tell us about Pavillard? Was he a, a good doctor? Uh, well, he was at this camp. Yes. Um, when malaria started, he mm. did wonderful work can you give us a, a picture of what he looked like? Uh, I understood he used to wear a forage cap and a, 
Fondusa. Basil Lewis. That was his formal, formal gear. Yeah. What about uh, Robert Hardy? Did you know Hardy? I knew him, but he, I never came across him on the railway. No. no. Came across him in Singapore. I remember going along to the MI room and he giving me a lot of empty tins of Marmite or Vegemite or something, saying, if you pour hot water in these, you might get something out of them, which yeah. I did do. And now, when you talk about that river camp, was that a, a camp that had very steep uh, banks going down to the river? Or? Yeah. No. But it had been an Aussie camp earlier. Yes. Because uh, there were some graves there with concrete markers. Oh, how many? I can't remember now. Was it a low number? Was it something like three or four, less than half a dozen? Or less, was it? less than half a dozen, I think not many. It's good, it's good. Mm. Well, I think I know where, well, I know another, another location where there were some concrete uh, crosses. Mm -hmm. oh, that'll be an interesting one to follow through. Now, when you, what, about what date were you talking about when you were around Kinsayok or down at the river camp? Bearing in mind that the, the line was completed in October 43, so around what date are we looking at? This must have been in 43, I think. Yes. I have an idea we went down to the camp by rail. Yes. Slowly coming back. I think our party was shifted down there by rail and dropped off. Now, were you, if we go forward now to, as you know, officially it's said that the line was joined on the 17th of October 1943. Mm -hmm. Did you ever know that the rail was finished and that I it was... we heard it because when we were at um, Kinsai, it was definitely working. Yes. A moment ago you mentioned that the Korean came down and told you the general was coming around to inspect things. Mm -hmm. How did you communicate with the Korean? What language? Uh, I think rather broken English. Yes. This chap was quite intelligent, I think. But, uh, we never had any trouble with him. In fact, when this particular thing came, he said he wanted us to unload a barge of rice before they turned up. And we said, oh, we'll give the bastard a chance, I think. And we all worked like stink to open this barge and load it up there. Mm. And uh, he was so grateful that he took us to the Nip store and got us each a pair of Indian Army boots. Which, I mean, they were godsend. Mine were too small for me, and I passed them on to my cousin who was there, so but they weren't wasted. I was just going to ask you about sizes. <laughs> mm. So you've answered that. So the, when the line's finished, where, where were you taken to from about the end of 1943? Um, Did you stay on the line and do maintenance? or anything like that? We did our job, it didn't do very much. Mm. But, um, when you got up to the Vietnamese border, when was that then? Vietnamese. No, Vietnamese. No, I never did the Vietnamese border. I didn't go beyond, uh, what's your name? Kinsayok. Just north of Kinsayok. Rintin? No, didn't get as far as Rintin. Mm. I think we mainly stopped at Kinsale. Did you come across any Dutch at any time? Um, the odd ones, not many, I don't know. Remember the parade? Must have been, may have been at Kinsale. They all dressed in their best. And the Dutch airmen turned out absolutely. How I managed to do it all, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but just stuff. I, to me, there's a little gap that I'm trying to understand is that from the end of the line, there is all of 1944 and nine months of 1940, eight months of 1945, that I'd mm. like to try and work out where you were. Well, the rest of 44, we were 
concern the uh, they were turning the the so-called sick very bad sick were being sent down mm. um, we men there doing our job didn't do very much yes food wasn't bad when you're I believe that somewhere in the vicinity of Kinsar there was a quite a steep gradient and sometimes the trains had difficulty getting over it. Did you ever no. experience anything? I heard about it. Yes. Sure. Where they'd get, get uh, some of the POWs out of the camp to assist pushing it over the hill. <laughs> yeah. right. be surprised. Right. Yes, I never heard about that. And, and of course they were running the engines on, which are supposed to be run on coal, on wood and bamboo. Mm. And bamboo's got a very intense heat but for, for a very short period of time mm. so they had very very great difficulty in uh, getting these the steam up on these uh, steam engines mm -hmm. now well, I think they had these um, lorries which they could run on the rail and they were kind of diesel lorries I think they were very efficient yes now how many trucks could they pull roughly what they wouldn't have pulled as much as a steam engine I'm sure there was only a couple I think in did you ever see uh, the brothel trains go through? Uh, no, I think when they, as far as supplying the brothels were concerned, they were supplied by lorry at Kinsale. Mm. It was an amusing incident there. Yes. They were all, the Japs were lined up to go into it, and there was a few Tamils around the camp who kept cleaning up and so on. We saw a Tamil brushing the ground about a couple of feet up, <laughs> he was looking, seeing, seeing the fun and games through there. <laughs> and the chap came up and <laughs> kicked him up. <laughs> it was so bloody funny, it was very difficult not to laugh at the poor bugger. Yes, <laughs> I'll follow it. Now you said that you uh, came from, when the war ended, um, where were you when that, that occurred? Um, Now we were taken down from Kinsale down to Tam Tamakan or the one not at the bridge. Tamiwan is one at the bridge. Ta Tam no, uh, Tamakan is the one at the bridge, and there's another one, Tamwan. Yes, well we went back there and yeah. there quite a while. Big camp, about five thousand. Mm. Uh -huh. And in December '44. You know the um, my my um, cousin was there. And he, to, he was an officer and used to supply me with eggs and so on. Mm -hmm. And in a, in his um, barracks was a, a captain. I've got his photo here. Um, anyway, it might help if I mention his name. Dennis, he was a regular artillery. Yes. And he was a friend of my uh, neighbours. And he said, I've just been instructed to get a party of 120 to go up to uh, Tai Sang, or whatever it was, um, to build a, a bridge. Would you like to join us? And I said, yes, thanks very much. And um, anyway, he he managed to pick the blokes he wanted, to, but he had to take an awful lot he didn't like the look of. Mm. But um, we went to this camp. We marched from Tarso across to the other river. Oh yes, yeah. Um, this was only a kind of escape route they were getting ready, mm. and we started power driving there. And, the nips were extremely good. And that was where uh, Barclay Dennis came and asked, asked us, the volunteers, there were the half a dozen volunteers, mm. and, uh, when there was a bit of trouble, if we'd back him up. Mm. Because the British sergeants and so on he got were useless. Mm -hmm. And then they well, turned their toes up at him. Mm. And Evidently, one of these Brits 
that raided the Jack Cook house and pinched a lot of their pork. And there was really no excuse for it because we were reasonably fed. Mm. And the Japs were raising hell on it. And Barclay Dennis said, um, let me punish him. The Japs were only too glad to get rid of him, I think, because they, they weren't a bad crowd then. Mm. And when the, um, the British um, W.O. well, no, not W.O. as a sergeant, corporals and so on, mm. were useless, and so mm. we, all privates and the volunteers, were doing their work for mm. them. Mm. And there was an old murmur in the camp about a oh, jap heavy bastard or something mm. about them, you know. Mm. And uh, I know we went and dealt with them. Mm. And um, Dr. Dennis tied this bloke to a tree. And whenever uh, we went to work, he was untied. Went, um, and then um, tied, when the mate was uh -huh. there, he was tied again to the tree. Yes. Not very tightly, no. I think. No. And they, one of us had to be on guard at it, and I think he couldn't get anywhere he trusted. <laughs> Standing over this bloke, or rather chatting with him on anything, I think. Mm. And um, things were. Well, it was kind of. You can't call it mutiny. There was an awful lot of murmuring about these other bastards. Mm. And the gyps and necks were quite happy that Barker Dennis had dealt with this bloke. Mm. And we'd settled down again, and then the next day, um, must have been. But the first raid was the 8th of December, wasn't it, or something like that? Yeah, 44. Mm. Uh, on the bridge? On the bridge. Around that time. It was certainly mm. December. Mm. Mm. And we were immediately, as a so-called expert came, yes. <laughs> taken back to Tarso and back to the bridge. Yes. And um, we was, there was a large camp, there were a lot of houses and so on, a very mm. pleasant, well-run camp. Which one, Tamarcan? Yes, mm. at the bridge. Mm. Roughly where we were having our lunch that day, I think. That's right, mm -hmm. yes. And, well, it was, as I say, it was very well run because mm. it, I remember my first night there, the first morning, that somebody took in my turn and said, What do you want for breakfast, mate? And I said, What the hell is this? And I was from the canteen. Yes. Who, who bought a long fried eggs. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> seemed unbelievable to me. Yes. And um, we, we were put on to power driving a, mm. an auxiliary bridge. Wow. Where was that? Beside it. Yes. It's one of those things you've seen on the photos. Yes. But um, we only did that mm. for a short time. Mm. But uh, it was rather amusing doing one of the air raids. Uh, we got into funk holes at the corner bit, and the Japs all disappeared. Mm. And um, the, well, there was no damage to the bridge anyway. Mm. And <coughs> when we we started work, as you know, the next day we came back there, and we were driving a power driver, about twenty men each one with a rope, mm. and we held like this, mm. and. Um, the thing shot up, mm. and it had been really hard to pull it before. Yes. And the old Nip broad grin, he said, Churchill Presento. Yeah. And uh, he said, what? And it only, this napalm hadn't ignited. Mm. It was only, uh, there was an area broke amongst the crowd, and he said he thought it was just the weather. And, and so it, he'd used this to, to grease the thing, but it didn't even ignite then. Yes. It looked like Vaseline. Yes, yes. And uh, we kept on that until Christmas, I think it was. We had Christmas there and they were gradually emptying the camp because it had two raids. And uh, there had been um, getting rather close because they, they blew two of our huts away to bits. Well, the 19 were killed in one of the raids. Yes, mm. a friend of mine was. Mm. But um, during these air raids, that nip 
sat on a chair in the middle of the parade ground, mm. like this on his sword, mm. watching it all. Mm. I think the pure guts are in. Yes. Can I take you back to when you were saying that you were, you went out to work on a bridge near Tarsau, mm. uh, on the other river is what mm. you said. Now, if I would you be able to put a name to that? W would that be a place called Tardan? Tardan. Tardan. Yes, it was. Incredible thing. Bill Haskell was on building the same bridge. He was on that. Wasn't yes. He? Isn't this incredible? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because you weren't there though. Because it's on the May Klong River, not on the Kwai mm. Kwai Noi. Yeah. Because there are very few Aussies on the, on this. Yes. But we're all mixed. Yeah. I'll tell Bill. I wonder if he remembers the, the Tarden Port. Well, we're going. We're actually going out to Tarden on this trip mm. because it's it's only twenty kilometres off from Tarsau. Yes, mm. that was a reasonable march and not too bad. Oh right? well, it's much better in the tourist coach. Oh, I bet it is. Now, does the name Colonel Newey mean anything to you? Yes. I don't know whether we had a very good opinion of him or not. Well, that, that's an impression I get that. He was a, you used the term a little while ago, Jap happy, and uh, that's what I understood the situation was with mm -hmm. him. Yes. Yes, it wasn't like Lily. Yeah. What about pile driving? Is it? Tell us a, what. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is pile driving like? It's not a bad job. Mm. You've, got, you've got this long thing with pulleys at the top. Yes. Each one has a rope. Yes. And uh, provided you all that you can present an itchy niece, yes. whatever, I can't remember the rest itchy of it. Itchy niece, Sam, Chi. Mm -hmm. Stick it up, what's the name or something? Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah. we uh, did that for only a few days and then uh, for some reason we were shifted. Yes. And they brought another crowd to do that. Yes. And I never saw any of those bridges completed. No, no. Yeah. Now your return route to get to Singapore, uh, what was it? How did you? Well, we went back to um, Tamiwan. Yes, Tamiwan. Tamiwan. Yes. Yeah. And then we were shifted, went down by train to Bangkok. Yes. Were all the bridges intact when you went down there, or did yes, you? Yes, no trouble. No. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a rather nightmare. Um, on the docks, we went down to the docks, not to work, oh. kind of transit camp or something you might call it. Yes. And there'd been a raid before, and a few people had been killed. Mm. And we were only there one night, and then we were marched across Bangkok, mm. wearing only a Jap happy. Mm. And, uh, no footwear, no boots at that stage. I had a um, kind of chap that's made of. You know, there's made of a tar. Yes. They were fairly reasonable walking. Yes. Went to Bangkok to get a, a train of the other, other part of this. Yes. To go up to Titan, I don't know what it's called. We went right up. Did you go back up the line itself? No, we went east. Oh, yes. And Neck on Nyok or? Neck on Nyok, yeah. Yeah. Then we marched quite a way. Yes. And uh, quite a reasonable camp there, but that would have been that must have been about February or March. 45, I think. Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. A lot of people were shifted east of Bangkok and Nakhon Nark, a lot of people were in there. Yes, it was an officer's yeah. camp. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But um, that was a very good camp, huh? Yes. But um, they had, um, seemed to be built with a moat and uh, Ah. And walls. Yes. House walls. Yes. With machine guns pointing into the camp. Yes. 
and we often felt that they were to deal with us if necessary. Yeah. That, that is reported uh, from other sources as well. Mm -hmm. were, were you aware of any plan being made in case the Japs did that? No. no. So, if we go now forward to the 15th of August 1945, which is the day that the Japs capitulated, is it, did anything significant happen around that date, like paratroopers come in or...? Uh, well, we have been out to work digging tunnels in the hills, uh, mm -hmm. and we somebody, I never, I suppose it was true, a Thai evening went by uh, singing, they told me the war is over, do you know after the war is over? Yes. But it was always, uh, I suppose it was true. Yes. Because quite a few of those more educated Thais than anyway spoke English. Yes. So if that's 15th of Feb, mm -hmm. the 15th of August, and capitulation took place, how long did you stay at Nakong Nayok before you started moving towards Rangoon? About a, a week, mm -hmm. I think it was, because um, that we started off to work one day and then were called back. Mm -hmm. We knew something was in the air, but didn't know what. And the next morning, we found the uh, camp was empty of nips. Mm. Mm. None there at all. Mm. And there was a, a, I think it was a Hungarian sort of major in the volunteers, who, <laughs> he was actually the pianist in the Rella Band in Kuala Lumpur. Mm. But uh, he'd got, you know, having more time, he'd rather see the volunteers. Yes. Very nice book of, well, he changed his name, but he was in Reutenberg, I think. But yes. He changed, it, he changed it to Red Hill. Yeah. But he took charge very well. Mm. And the first thing he did was to get a lot of Lao into the camp, you know, the Japanese, the uh, Thai. What we call it Thai whiskey, mm. and he had it um, diluted fairly well, mm. and gave an issue of it, mm. which kept the blokes from going out of the camp. Yes, yes, yes. he was very bright, very wise. Um, and uh, the Japanese flag had that gone? Uh, did that? No sign of them at all. Uh, what about any uh, did the Union Jack? Did anyone find the Union yes, Jack? Yes, somebody found one. Bring it up. Yeah. Any any Dutch? Were you any Dutch there? Did any Dutch yes, flags? Yes, there were a few Dutch. And what about the Australian flag? Did that? No, there wasn't. No, never got to that. No, there were no Australians there. Mm. Only the only Australians were getting the volunteer ones. Yes. But. Uh, and then from the, from there you would have been shifted down to Bangkok. Yes, straight to the airport. Straight to the airport and then straight up to Rangoon. Mm. And then how long were you in Rangoon? About a fortnight, I mm. And from there, where did you go? We, uh, we went on a trip at home. Yeah. To, it was rather amusing, this particular yeah. ship. Yeah. Just yeah. Hold that a moment, Dave. Yeah. I'll just well, to Curtis, I don't know who was flying. We dropped supplies and so on. And uh, also, um, a couple of paratroopers, I don't I can't remember what, uh, what they were to do there. I think they were officers. But um, one caused a lot of amusement, it's only there they went into the latrines. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But um, these Dakotas came through. By then we had um, large bamboos with one the Union Jack and the other um, the um, Dutch flag. Mm -hmm. But the Dakota took the Dutch flag off with its tailwheel. Yes. <laughs> and 
No, the Dutch weren't too popular there. I don't think there's a lot of cheers amongst the Americans and yeah. British as well. Well, the, the Dutch were never well received, were they? Yeah. Mm, which is a shame. Now, from Rangoon, where did you go? To Colombo. And then from... Ah, so when did you catch up with your wife? Oh, fortnight or three weeks later, in, mm. in, uh, at my old home in the New Forest. We were landed at uh, Southampton. Yes. Went through a transit cab there. Yes. And uh, I got a lift to my old home, which is only just down the road. Yes. Where my wife and father were. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that wasn't a, a joyous occasion. Yes, it certainly was. Um, now the thing I didn't mention about that ship is when I went out in 29 on a trip to Malaysia is I had a, a single berth cabin in that ship and when I was repatriated I had the mess table <laughs> roughly below where my cabin was. Oh. Sleeping out of yeah. sh probably sharing it with someone, were you? Or? <laughs> no, mm. uh, I pinched the mess table, otherwise they're all in hammocks. Yes. I've never been in a hammock and didn't know which to try. Yes, yeah. If, if you cast your mind back, are there any examples of innovation, you know, creativity of people where, you know, to create more comfort, you know, someone's been able to make something, or do you know of anything on the medical side where you know where they improvise to? to achieve certain aims? The medical side we never came across with no. it, honey. Mm -hmm. but, um, all that sort of stuff was done at the main camp, I think. Yeah. What was the worst example of Japanese brutality that you observed? Well, it was so much bashing, I don't know. I think the worst thing, which had nothing to do with the POWs, was they strung the dog up by its legs and had bandit practice on it. Yeah, yeah, callous. Mm. Any examples of com compassion by them? Well, that Nip uh, Camp Commandant, I mean, he chased the guards up to help the, the chaps after the bombing raid. Yes. So that was at, uh, at Tamakan? At the bridge. Yes, mm. Tamakan. Yeah. What was that story about? You had to carry a jet officer. Oh, okay, it's about that. Mm. When we were working on the pile driving, mm. a launch came by with a jet officer on it, who, you know, they knew whatever they do, but they yeah. were the rude way. Mm. Yeah. And I was one of the fitter ones and was told to go out to him. Mm. And he was, um, it was not very really deep water, I don't swim much up to my knees. Mm. And so I had to carry him like this. Mm. Well, I went straight ahead and I must have gone into a bomb hole. And then he drowned the bastard. And he was draw really roaring at me. Mm. And the sergeant in charge of our party, even in the Japanese army, the man in charge of the party is in charge. And it, it wasn't that they, he would tell this officer to politely to bugger off. Mm. I mean, you know, and he told me to sit down by the fire. <laughs> While the others would continue their power driving. Yes. yes. But, uh, it always amused me that. Yes. Mm. What, and I, I'm not sure whether we got this on tape, but um, at Wampo you mentioned uh, where a Jap fell into the river and he was rescued. That was at Wampo South, yes. Yeah. yeah. Would you mind repeating that? I, I, I don't think we got it on the tape earlier. We, I think we were t just talking about it. Um, we were crossing the, the boat with our tools and this jet guard. Mm. And uh, the boat, I don't, can't remember why it sunk. But um, we were all had the opportunity of a swim. Mm. And the jet guard was obviously floundering and one of the chaps rescued him. And everybody said, why the hell did you rescue the bastard? You ought to let him drown. Well, mm. I don't know, he said they worked automatically. Yes. And uh, anyway, the Jap gave us each a cigarette. Yes. And then told us to collect the tools. And uh, the first Jap went down and said, I found them. 
but we keep on looking for them until he gets annoyed. And we kept on diving for these tools and coming up again until we got tired out. And then we suddenly found them mm. and brought them all ashore. Mm. And that's what well, they gave us a cigarette for saving them. Yes. Did you uh, ever have anything to do with uh, fishing when they dynamited the river? Yes. Um, can you tell us about that? I got quite clever at uh, stealing the fish, but um, we had to give it, hand them over to the nips. And the first day we didn't do it, and I, next time I thought when I went I had got a trouser leg which mm. I'd sewn up and tied it to my wrist, mm. hanging down. And when we went to get the fish, I shoved the fish into this and stared around like that and uh, hand the rest to the, to the nips. So we used to do quite nicely on that. Yes. Because there's no trouble about fires and cooking and so on. Yes. Well, George, I, I don't know that we can cover much more. Have you got anything else that you had in mind that you'd like to tell us? Have you any ideas, Paul? Um, I, yeah. um, I was working in the uh, cookhouse for only for a short time oh. at one pub, and a sack full of dried meat turned up, and we had to pound it and wash it in the river and so on. Uh -huh. And we had a fairly good meal of it, I think. Oh. And the next day I was itching all over the place and jumped in the river and um, I went to um, down to the hospital tent or the hospital hut where Pavelard was and uh, he said, you ever had a horse injection? I said, horse injection? You know, it was broken English. And I said, no sir. And the orderly was there I said, have you ever had the, the um, diphtheria jab? Uh -huh. I said, yes. He said, oh, that's all it is. And he gave me a, a, a jab or something. I don't know what it was, but it stopped the itching. Uh -huh. and, and the meat wasn't too bad when it was boiled. Dried horse. Yes, yeah. you only got to be hungry. Mm. Yes, the orderly there was ex jockey, I can't remember what his name was. In nice place. An English yes, jockey. Yeah. Yeah. A is it, does Pavelard name him in his book, do you, do you recall? I don't remember. Mm. Oh, yes, a great friend of mine was on that. Yes. And a lot of them died. Yes, huge numbers. Um, I don't think that adds anything to it. No. They were on that camp near where, um, what's his name was on, wasn't it? Wally. It was done up in the others. No, the f much further up. Was the British one? No, the H and F force were right up on the Burma border, near mm. Three Pagodas Pass, in the most uh, dreadful conditions. Yes, Teddy Totally was on that. Actually, I'd like to just explore a couple of points. Did you um, come across cholera at any time? Yes. And, and what, what, how, how did the medics deal with the cholera patients? Well, as, as far as Pavlov was concerned, he uh, got us all together and said, if you only eat, only if you buy fruit, mm. you can get fruit, mm. you must peel it. And uh, the other thing he said, and always scald your utensils. Mm. And there were some of these rather tough, very semi-educated um, seventh or eighth Night Coast Artillery, I think, from uh -huh. Singapore. And he scared the guts out of them and said, put them, and they would, they would do anything to, to 
George Carra. Yes. And uh, we had these colossal collies, mm. and it was our job to keep them boiling. Mm. And we were never allowed to use our utensils unless they'd been dropped in that. Yes. And our particular unit, I think we had one suspicious death, mm. an officer. And we don't think it was Carra. Mm. But the next one had about 200. Mm. It was purely thanks to Pablo. Yes. Um, the nasty thing we were brought into um, to help clear up one of these cholera camps, and they were burning them. Mm. And, um, they had to bury them later on because they couldn't. It was rather grim, man. Mm. The fellow man was saying skulls and so were rolling down off these piles, and yes. they had to shove them back in again. Yeah. Did you, were you ever in the uh, proximity of the Cooley camps? No. 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 Unfortunately, we were suffering from them because there's one very nice camp on a stream. Yes. That's where the cholera started. Yes. And uh, up above us was Ebony Tamil camp. Yes. And they were using the stream for literally everything. Yeah, yeah. You've got no chance if that's happening. Yeah. Mm. Well, I have actually exhausted myself with questions. Okay, that's yeah. right.